don't see any. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So next up, we have Stephen Barth from OpenWRT. He's talking about an IPv6 configuration framework on OpenWRT. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I was actually asked to maybe give a little intro into OpenWT before talking about V6. So, why do we think we need uh, OpenWT? Well, the thing is that many home routers and uh, small enterprise routers are very bad, and they are often outdated, and they have countless security issues. And actually, a few months ago, when I got my new cable connection at home, and the tech guy that installed the, uh, the plug and gave me the modem, he said, oh yeah, you should probably reboot it every week or so because it gets slower over time and if you don't reboot it, it will fail at some point. So I said, oh, that's nice. Can you get me a better thing? Oh no, sorry, we can't. The vendor does it and they won't fix it or they don't care enough. So what we want to accomplish is um, have a, an open source framework or reference uh, design or SDK for routers that actually does things right, that is up to date, that offers the latest features. And over time, we see that um, from these old vendor SDKs, the old kernels and the old user land, um, they just can't get any new features in there. IPv6 support is like, well, so and so in most boxes usually. And then you want to have advanced features like AQM or QS, there's buffer bloat and so on. And it's very hard to fix that based on those old um, SDKs. And usually the CPE vendors, they just take what they get from their uh, chipset vendors, just use the SDK, build some stuff on top of that, maybe a new web interface and use that as firmware, which is why things are hard to fix. So. OpenWT in a nutshell, we'll see um, the project is now over 10 years old and um, it's basically a custom Linux or uh, Linux with a custom user land. We try to upstream all our changes to the actual kernel. But um, nevertheless, there's a lot of stuff that we do differently than other Linux distributions. We have uh, a wide variety of user land tools and daemons. Um, for example, when you look at desktop Linux distributions, you see things like DBus for uh, message uh, exchange, just like all kinds of network manager for uh, network interface management. We all have our own tools for that, specifically designed to be uh, useful on embedded devices because we want things to be small. We have routers that only have like four megabytes or eight, eight megabytes of flash. So to get all those features in there, we need to have a really lean and lightweight system to support all of these features. But maybe a little administrative stuff. OpenWT is uh, registered as a project uh, of software in the public interest, which is kind of like the umbrella uh, thing that also covers Debian and LibreOffice and so on. And um, But they don't do that much for us. Um, we have a, a trademark registered in the US and they handle donations for us and that's about it. Um, there's mainly um, OpenWT's loosely associated group of core developers and a lot of other contributors, um, mainly all over the world, but it seems to be the core developers are mainly uh, based in Europe and uh, mainly in Germany and neighboring countries. So it's really, yeah, ripe area if you want to call it that. And we actually, even if it doesn't say so, um, there are many million devices out there that actually run OpenWT, but most of them do not claim to run OpenWT because it's like the, the vendor or the manufacturer used OpenWT, forked it at some point years ago, and then just wrote their name on it, which is fine with us as long as they just release the GPL sources, which is another issue. But okay, uh, I guess enough for OpenWT. And uh, by the way, um, we should have our next release candidate out in a few days. So hopefully, it's always we're always late. We apologize for that, but usually it's done when it's done. So I'm talking about IPv6 now. 
What's the difficulty of building an IPv6 router? Well, back in the IPv4 days on home routers, there's this thing you had a very static configuration. You just configured your uh, LAN addresses, your prefix or subnet, and it always stayed the same. You got your IP address from your ISP that was changing maybe, but the router didn't really care because all the NAT was hiding these changes. And maybe the only thing that might change a bit is like the DNS server address from the ISP or so. More advanced routers had some failover capabilities or so that might add some more logic. But all in all, it was pretty straightforward. You got DHCP or PPP connection from your ISP and that got you an IP address and then you did DHCP to your clients and you could also handle host names of that. So when you plugged in your printer, you could just type in HTTP printer and reach the uh, web interface of your printer from any device. So that was neat and easy and clean and now you got V6, right? So this uh, slide, I try to uh, more or less cover what we have to do now to set up a V6 connection only with the ISP and this is, there was an interesting talk in the uh, IPv6 session just earlier about uh, client configuration, about um, router advertisements in DHPv6 and all those uh, interconnectedness between them. So now what we see here is um, you get a prefix from your ISP using DHPv6 PD and router addresses, I mean public address for the router using either RA or DHPv6, that's where the trouble starts. You don't know which uh, method to use really. So you just try one and then try the other if it fails because there's no sane fallback path really. And usually there's no way to signal routes in DHPv6 so you have to use RAs for that. But then again, some ISPs don't send you an RA so you can either fail or just assume, yeah, I'll magically send my package to the DHPv6 server source address and hope that works. And in most cases, it actually did when there was no RA. So that's what we had to do then. And also other things that we've seen with ISPs is there's ISPs that send us RAs every three seconds, even though there are no changes. But then still they reset the timers for the routes, they reset the timers for the address. And so you basically get an update every three seconds. And if you trickle that update through all your processes internally, you get a lot of excess uh, CPU load or whatever if you don't filter them out uh, properly. And even then, you have to think about if you filter too much, then you're losing some events, and that's bad as well. So um, back uh, a few years ago, um, I decided, OK, handling RAs and DSPv6 is an issue. And all the tools that were available at that point weren't really good at it, so we had to create a new project, which is, well, doesn't really have a good name. It's just ODHP6C, which is a combined DHPv6 and RA client, and it handles PD and tries to be clever about ISPs not sending RAs or doing nasty things with PD or not. And it also tries to get you into all of the funny transitioning technologies which is what I'll cover next. Because, you know, uh, just simple IPv6 connections wouldn't be fun enough, or dual stack or whatever, so um, ISPs and network people and the ITF, they came up with, I don't know, maybe a good dozen of transitional technologies, which probably still all have their place somewhere. And you can see from 6 and 4, which is like the stuff you get with uh, HGNet or 6 as tunnels. And there's 6RD, which um, usually was used in early rollouts of IPv6 by bigger ISPs. These are based on encapsulating v6 on top of v4, and so they're configured either statically or using DHCP. And then you have the traditional dual stack, which is just run DHCP and v6 in parallel. and we also have uh, all kinds of uh, encapsulating or translating v4 to v6 uh, things like DS Lite, Lightweight 4 over 6, Map E, Map T, and 464X LUT, which is mainly used in uh, mobile networks these days. So the difficulty here is that 
all these things have different configuration mechanisms. They have different methods to um, interact with the firewall. So you need a really uh, flexible network configuration system. You need to be able to stack protocols on top of another. So if you like connect a 4G modem to your uh, router or a 3G modem, then you may need to set up a PVP connection. On top of that, you run the DHPv6 and the RA, and then on top of that, you may run the 464X LAN. So that's really difficult. And um, difficulty doesn't stop there because you need to configure your clients, right? And as we as we seen earlier, there's RAs and DHPv6, and they're a bit intertwined, and some features are supported by one, and some features by the other, and um, there are many differences in handling these in different OSs, and there's prefix delegation if you want to support uh, downstream routers behind your CPE, and you have to work around a lot of quirks, and for example, with router advertisements, you can just always push an update if there's like a renumbering event from your ISP, or if you do failover from one ISP to another, but with DHPv6, you can't because your clients only pull updates at a certain interval. So what you have to deal with is you have to kind of work around that. So you could say, uh, why do I care about stateful DHPv6 at my home? Well, um, there's a naming issue. There's really no good way to name uh, or to add name entries for IPv6 addresses other than DHPv6. You could use like stuff like MDNS, but it isn't really cross-platform. Maybe it works on Linux and uh, Mac, but it doesn't work on Windows. So you're really stuck there and you have to find a way out. And what I usually do, or in our defaults, what we do is we support Slack for all yeah, the usual clients. And for example, Android it doesn't do DHPv6 at all. But at the same time, we enable the managed flag and also offer stateful addresses. But if you get stateful addresses in, um, in parallel, then we only hand out a ULA address using v6 and global addresses using RAs. So we can still renumber the global addresses, but can still do the naming using the, using the ULAs. And yeah, there's also uh, an open source project for that, which is like DHPv6 and RA server, uh, which supports reconfiguration and PD and so on, which is called ODHPD. Yeah. So what do we do if we have multiple uplinks or multiple routers? So um, in the V4 world, you had this uh, NAT thing, which just translated the source addresses. But now with V6, you can't do that simply because, I mean, you could do stateless NAT, right? But do you really want to? And the other way around is uh, you really do source address over routing. That means if you get a, a packet, you not only uh, examine the destination of your address, uh, of your packet, but also the source address. And if it has a source address from ISPA, you cannot send it out the interface of ISPB because it might just get source filtered. So you have to either do fancy policy routing or uh, operating systems like Linux now have real support for source aware routing. So you have, uh, you have to generate from usual RAs, not only destination routes, but source aware routes. You have to correlate them. But then again, if you have multiple routers in your home, what do you do? You could do layer two bridging, which is gets nasty if you have multiple link types, and especially on Wi-Fi, you don't want to really have that much layer two uh, traffic going on anywhere, especially with broadcast and multicast. So what you could do is uh, DSP 6 PD, or uh, yeah, for V4, you did NAT cascades, but that pretty much limits you to tree-like topologies, and if you have multiple routers which have uplinks, then you can see that um, not every device in your network will get addresses from both uplinks, so there's that. How can we tackle that? Well, so as you've seen, we can more or less uh, deal with all the transitional technologies. The router can more or less configure itself, but um, what we really wanna do is build plug and play routers, right? We don't wanna care about what a WAN port is or what a LAN bridge is. We just wanna have network ports you plug in somewhere and then the router should figure itself out. Is it an ISP connection? Is it another internal router? Is it something else? And also if you start bringing in multiple ISPs into your network, 
we have the issue that um, who actually owns the router. Many ISPs have uh, technologies like TR69 or NetConf, so you basically manage a whole lot of features for your router. When you bring in multiple routers from different ISPs, then there's kind of conflict of authority there. So what you really have to do is try to find a consensus, and um, this is uh, what I'm and uh, colleagues of mine are working on in uh, the ITF Home Networking Group, where we do uh, try to create protocols to uh, do these distributed and a consensus mechanism. I think uh, Martin gave a talk in one of the last rives about the home net stuff, if I remember correctly. So how does that work? So what the network should do is all these routers have to figure out their topology. They have to figure out the borders of the network. Am I connected to the ISP? Is this internal to set up routing at home? You know, th this might, s might sound scary, right? When I start with like, I don't know, OSPF, ISIs in your home. But really, w what's, what's the other way? Or what's, uh, what uh, other ways can we solve this problem other than introducing routing or doing nasty things on layer two with bridges or uh, bridge routers and so on? So really, once we have set up this, we can easily uh, add features like naming and service discovery. You know, DNSSD and all the Apple Bonjour stuff usually runs on the local link, so you have to proxy around and um, do uh, stuff that a device um, being on one router can detect a printer or uh, some multimedia thing on another router. So we, ha uh, we actually implemented some proxies there which hook into our HNCP and DNCP system which announce the names for all of these links and so we actually have an interconnected network. And the nice thing about this, since this is designed a bit like a link state protocol, you can just go to any router in your home net and connect to it, get a status, and you uh, instantly get information, status, topology, addresses, and so on from all the other routers in your home net. So even um, in an ISP case, um, if an ISP were to run this technology, then um, it could not only see your, uh, its own router that it uh, sent to the uh, customer, but it can also see the whole network topology behind that. And the customer gives a support call, and it can actually maybe find out easy, uh, more easily what's going wrong there. So what we also do is, of course, security bootstrap. So uh, there are mechanisms in there that um, prevent you from actually falsely detecting, oh, there's an ISP, oh, no, it's just uh, some person trying to hijack your internet traffic and so on. And it al actually also prevents you from uh, connecting or from introducing uh, false, uh, falsely um, or some routers that trying to impersonate your router. So if you're interested in that, and I hope so, you can uh, go to uh, our little project homepage for this home net stuff, which is homewt.org, or please also um, go to the ITF home networking group. We have uh, internet drafts for all of that, and they're in last call, or soon to be in last call, so if you wanna um, add feedback to this, please do so now or in the near future, because otherwise it's basically finished. So what do we see in the future here? probably more routers at home, right? Because if we only had single routers at home, why do we care about multi-router home nets? We have IoT devices with different link technologies like slow sensor net links, six low pan and so on. At some point, hopefully multipath TCP, which actually makes then good use of having multiple uplinks. And as I said, heterogeneous link types with Ethernet, Wi-Fi, power line, all of their different characteristics, especially in connection with broadcast or multicast. And at some point, we may actually see client applications actively selecting some ISPs for a specific service or feature. So at the moment, you may see, you may think, um, well, would the user bother to actually select something? But 
have a look at your smartphones, have a look at your iPhone or Android. There are many apps which actually let you decide, oh, I want to only use this app using Wi-Fi or it's okay to use this on my 4G network. And I guess we will see something uh, similar on regular client devices as well. So I guess there was a lot of stuff here and I hope I could enlighten you a bit about IPv6 and OpenWT. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Any questions? <laughs> okay, I don't see any questions. Thank you. So we're getting to our lightning talk. So the first person is uh, William Thurup. He's talking about some get DNS and updates there.